Good morning, I'm Christoph Koch. I'm the Chief Scientific Officer at the Erlen Institute for Brain Science. I'm sorry I'm unable to join you this morning in um, Yokohama. I'll give my talk on the subject of studying consciousness in, um, in the mouse. So the, um, the modern approach uh, to study um, consciousness is really based on studying its neuronal correlates, what today is called the neuronal correlates of consciousness. So the idea is for any one specific conscious experience, such as the experience of seeing a, a German shepherd here, there's some set of neuronal mechanisms in the brain or subneuronal mechanisms in the brain that are jointly, so, um, jointly uh, sufficient to give rise to that conscious sensation. And so the question is, where are those uh, neuronal mechanisms? Are they in one place? Are they distributed across the brain? Uh, what is the commonality for if you see a dog versus a cat versus a face versus a house? Um, is it a set of neurons? Is it a particular brain region? Is it a particular pattern of activity? Is it a standing wave synchronized activity? A particular molecular constituents? These are all proposals that people have made. Furthermore, for every one experience, for every specific experience that you're capable of having, there will be a neural correlate of consciousness. And if you induce this uh, neural correlate of consciousness, either using transcranial magnetic stimulation or microelectrode or optogenetics in an, in an experimental animal will induce that experience. Well, if you inactivate the neural correlate of, uh, of consciousness using some means, you will eliminate the associated conscious um, experience. So in a more a modern version, this comes from a review article, um, a more modern version is sort of schematized here. So you, you have always the same physical um, stimulus, in this case a very noisy image, that sometimes due to fluctuation in your brain, particularly if it's flashed only very briefly, sometimes you'll see as a face, then you push a button, yes, I saw a face, and various parts of the brain are active. Here sort of you see a schematized fMRI bold experiments. In this case, for the same physical input, you don't see a face, so you push uh, the no button, and then you do a contrast uh, between the two fMRI uh, um, bold signatures, and you see a, an area, a set of area, fusiform face area, extrastrite cortex, and something in the front of the brain. Now, of course, there are many uh, conf possible confounds here that you have to dissociate. There's particular selective visual attention that people now dissociate from consciousness. So you have to do at least a two by two design where you vary attention independently of consciousness. But then also here, there's a response pattern. You have to press the button. You have to keep the task at mind, in mind. So what people are now doing, they're, uh, they're moving to a no report paradigm. Works, for instance, where you randomly intermix report with non-report or use a different um, um, experimental paradigm, but here in this case, you uh, just as before, you see and sometimes you don't see, albeit there's no active task here, and then you uh, do the contrast, and then what you see, you still get the fusiform face area and the exostite cortex, but you don't see the prefrontal activity. So the current evidence suggests that um, a lot of these prefrontal activity are really due to the task and the task, uh, the task setting. Now this is different, this has to be distinguished the previous experiment um, relates to a content-specific neural correlate of consciousness, in this case seeing a face versus just seeing a noisy scene. Uh, a different paradigm is uh, to, um, to contrast seeing anything from seeing nothing whatsoever, having no conscious experience. So here typically an experiment would be like you're in a scanner, it's, there's no stimulus, this is sort of a resting state like a paradigm, there's no stimulus, you're awake, the eyes are closed, and you contrast that with the same subject when later on when you're asleep in the scanner, let's say in deep sleep stage four. Uh, and then you do a contrast, you see, um, you see this pattern of activity schematized. Again, now of course, here you're confounding different states. You have a non-REM state versus a waking state. So the best paradigm, really the cleanest paradigm here is to do what's called now within state no task paradigm. Well, here you have subjects that, um, that are asleep. You wake them up at, at some random point in time and you ask them what went through your mind 20 seconds before, and then you can correlate the physiological, st uh, the physiological correlates of, of that st state at that particular time using EG. Uh, in this case, it's done using fMRI. And there again, what you see, you see primarily, you see activity, so-called hotspots in the, in the back of the brain. So summarizing a lot of, um, 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 uh, this, um, this approach here, once again, the content-specific uh, neural correlate of consciousness are the physical mechanism whose activity examines a particular phenomenal distinction within an experience. So seeing a face versus not uh, seeing a face or seeing a house versus a face. That has to be distinguished from the, from the full NCC, as I said, and the, um, 
the, uh, the full NCC can be thought as a union of all possible content-specific NCCs for all possible experiences. And this must be distinguished conceptually from background conditions. So we know there are all sorts of conditions that have to obtain in order for you to be conscious of anything at all. Your heart has to pump. There has to be glucose. There has to be appropriate neuromodulatory factors present. Afferent inputs for adequate cortical arousal. If those are not present, you're not going to be um, conscious of anything at all. But those things do not directly contribute to any one specific content. That's really the content-specific NCC and the, f and the full NCC. So reviewing sort of 120 years of functional neurology, particularly the older literature uh, of lesions, which of course is in a sense inferentially much more powerful than fMI literature, which is just um, correlation, it really implicates a, a set, we call it um, a hotspot, this is a review article with Giulio Tononi and others, a cortical hotspot in the back of the brain at this sort of uh, posterior, parietal, um, temporal, occipital junction in various different conscious states. Most of them are visual, some are auditory, and some involve the um, um, and volition. So it's not so much the front of the brain that seems to be more involved in, in um, uh, multitasking, in setting up the task, possible in higher order thoughts, but for basic sensory level con conscious experience, in particular visual and auditory, it seems to be the back of the cerebral cortex that's most closely and most intimately related to consciousness in humans. Now, ultimately, we don't uh, want only um, experimental neural colleagues of consciousness, but we need a theory. We need a principled way that tells us in a quantitative, in a predictive manner, which physical systems are capable of having conscious experience, whether they are evolved like brains or whether they're possible artificial like computers. The only real candidate of such a theory is the integrated information theory of Giulio Tononi. I don't have time to talk about it. It proceeds from some fundamental axioms. So it proceeds from phenomenology. It proceeds from experience to postulates to specific mechanisms in a state that are, that are capable of conscious um, experience. At the heart of this theory is really the assertion that consciousness ultimately has to do with, with networks that are in a particular state that are, ca that are both highly differentiated and highly integrated. What do I mean by that? Differentiated because we know every possible experience I can have is one out of an uncountable, almost infinite number of different experiences. Just think about all possible scenes of every possible movie you've seen or you will ever see or that's ever been filmed. Each one is a discrete conscious experience. Yet each of those conscious uh, experiences is also highly integrated. It's one, it's unique, it's unitary. So if I see something like the audience here, I don't see the, the left audience and the right audience, I see everything as a whole. So it has to be integrated. This has been much remarked upon by philosophers. Um, the theory provides a measure phi. Phi really is, is a measure of the degree to which the system exists and to, to which the system is conscious. And it makes some very specific prediction regarding phi. Now, phi in principle can be, as, can be computed for any one particular mechanism in a particular state, and it can be estimated for things like the, the brain. So one way to estimate it here, so here I, I, I show what I mean in terms of uh, a brain that's in a high integrated and low integrated state. So here, um, I, the, the measure of integration is sort of functional connectivity. Here, the, the measure of integration would be different in involving in time different EG patterns. As the brain evolves here, you see many different patterns. So this is highly differentiated versus low differentiated. Uh, people have attempted to measure this. There were a series of papers um, in science and in brain and more coming out where they estimated um, uh, the uh, uh, they, they provide an estimate for the measure of integration and differentiation using a so-called zap and zip technique. What it is, you, you have a patient or a subject here asleep. Uh, so in this case, she wears a net of 128 EG, high density electrode, and then you apply a TMS, a subthreshold TMS pulse. You do that 100 or 200 times to get at the deterministic portion of that. So that perturbs the cortical circuit, and you estimate the complexity of the underlying neuronal response, as I say, by the by the high density EG. And then you can derive a measure called the perturbation complexity index, PCI. You plot it, it's a single a number. You derive it by looking at the, uh, the uh, lempel ziv complexity of the underlying neuronal response in, in human for, for cortex. Here you volunteer that are awake. The PCI index is high, typically around 0.6. Here the subjects go to sleep, in deep sleep, phase three, um, non-REM. The uh, PCI goes down. Here, the same subject, these are, uh, these are anesthesiologists, 
sort of subject them is uh, they are um, anesthetized using three different uh, anesthetics. Again, when they are anesthetized by clinical measure, their PCI is low. This has also now been repeated with uh, ketamine, which is a dissociative anesthetic, where people uh, don't move or don't move in an organ behavioral uh, relevant way, but are certainly conscious. Um, and then this has also been measured now in over 200 patients. Here's an older paper where there are fewer patients, a vegetative state patient, minimal conscious state patient, emerging minimal conscious state patient, and locked in syndrome. And in each case, at a, on, a, on a subject by subject level, when the PCI is low, the, the, the uh, subject, as indicated by other clinical measure, is unconscious or not, certainly not responsive. When the measure is high, the subject is conscious. So ch the challenge is, is now, so I'm just going to talk to you about a number of challenges, uh, ongoing experimental paradigms without going into the details. So here the challenge is to develop a mouse version to probe this measure of differentiation and integration in cortex, not using a TMS. It wouldn't be appropriate for the much smaller uh, brain uh, cortex of a mouse, but to use um, local um, electrical stimuli and then using um, a measure, a large measure of the cortical activity that we can, of course, in the mouse obtain at the cellular level to estimate, um, to estimate phi. Another uh, um, um, avenue to doing experiments on consciousness in the mouse is the, the theory, integrated information theory, makes a very clear prediction that a system that has, that's purely feed forward like a, like a deep learning uh, network has a phi of zero. It makes uh, this, this very clear. The, such a system, although it's capable of complex behavior, although it's capable ultimately of displaying what we would call intelligence in people, such a system is strictly unconscious. Um, so, for instance, the, the cerebellum, of course, is a, is a beautiful instance of a system that's uh, of a piece of brain that's highly complex, has many different neurons, but the local circuits, in particular, seem to be primarily feed forward to first order. And of course, you have many of many of them in parallel. The, the, the theory predicts that such a network would have very low phi. And indeed, experimentally, we know it's been observed that if, pe if patients have lesions in their cerebellum, or in this case, if you're born without a cerebellum at all, this is from a recent patient, 24-year-old uh, 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 Chinese lady that's born congenitally without a cerebellum. These patients, they have problems with ataxia, etc., um, um, affective, um, uh, affective cognitive cerebellar uh, syndrome, but they don't complain that they have any loss of conscious experience, and the theory would predict that. Now, in principle, you can turn, uh, if you have a feed forward, if you have a complex system like in, in cortex that's heavily feedback using modern optogenetics tools, in principle, either by inactivating higher cortical regions or by reducing cortical cortical uh, feedback via optogenetic intervention, you should be able to lower phi max. And of course, there's this beautiful experiment that came out last year in, um, in, in Neuron by the lab of Murayama. That, that looked at uh, high order feedback, and so the prediction would be in such an animal, if you can probe uh, phi max using the zip and zap uh, procedure, you should find a lower uh, phi max under those conditions. Another approach that's been immensely popular and successful in humans, as well as in monkey, is to do visual uh, masking. So to, to mask a stimulus such that, that the subject doesn't see it as, a me as measured by his or her subjective co uh, confidence, but the stimulus is still present and still gives rise to, uh, to responses, implicit responses, that you can measure either in the behavior of the subject or in fMRI or some other physiological measure. So here the challenge is in, in the mouse is to develop a visual backward masking paradigm. The most powerful masking paradigm are binocular in humans, so that's less optimal for, for a mouse where the eyes are much more lateral placed. And then to study systematically to inactivate different brain regions uh, systematically, let's say in the visual system, higher order brain region, and to compare the timing when you, um, when you inactivate using pulses of light to turn on interneurons in those different cortical areas, how that compares with the SOA, with the timing onset in the visual masking paradigm to understand when can you, under which condition is a backward mask um, equivalent to knocking out, let's say, in higher order visual area. Um, what you also would like to do is to introduce a measure of decision confidence. So this is a popular technique in human, where as a stand-in for consciousness, you assess the subject's confidence. So typically when you have an experience, you're very confident of it, you can signal that in a variety of different wa psychophysical ways. And this has also been done for monkeys, and of course there's one beautiful experiment in Nature in 2008 by Zach Manin where that was done in a rat. In principle, there's no reason why this could not be replicated in a mouse. 
to assess the confidence that the mouse has in its particular behavior for, for a particular trial. Now we here at the Allen Institute we are working um, on mice and the human brain. So the, the mouse brain has only 40 million neurons. In the visual system we estimate a third of a million in, in, um, in primary visual cortex. We set up over the last uh, four years sort of a variety of facility that shows you just an overview of the ELM behavioral training facility where we can train under highly reproducible patterns mice in a variety of visual ta uh, tasks. These are all visual tasks. The mouse is running on a, on a wheel. You see a movie of it. And it's shown di different stimuli that are flashed on or come on um, on, the, on the right side while the mouse is running. For particular stimulus, we, we teach it to, uh, if it recognizes it correctly, it stops, slows down, and gets rewarded by, um, by water. So here, this is from the group of, uh, of uh, Doug Ollershaw and Pete Grobleski and Sean, Sean Olson, who presented last year at the, at the Japanese Society of Neuroscience meeting. Here is so, sort of the, um, I'll show you just two psychophysical uh, uh, curves. So you flash on a very brief stimulus here for 50 milliseconds. The mouse gets rewarded if it licks, um, if it licks the water within one second of the stimulus. And you can get a classical psychophysical um, res uh, response curve as a function of uh, contrast. And here they do a standard manipulation um, as is done, you know, for, for the last two centuries in humans and re more recently in monkeys, you get the same result in mice. So, as you, so here you change the contrast of the stimulus, here you change the exposure of the stimulus, either it's on for 500 milliseconds, here it's on only for 16.7 milliseconds, and you get the appropriate shift of the curve to the right as seen here. In other words, when you have a, when you have a very briefly presented stimulus, you have to show it for much longer than a stimulus that's presented for a longer time. So this is sort of on the road towards developing um, a visual masking paradigm that's here not shown. Now at the same time, uh, a scientist here at the Allen Institute developed uh, so-called wide field imaging. This again is Doug Ollershaw and, and Sean Olson doing this in an uh, EMX pan excitatory uh, line um, through, throughout cortex. So you can hear very beautiful as the mouse is running and occasionally gets a stimulus here. You see indicated uh, uh, well, this is when it licks. You can see the activity pattern throughout the entire brain. And here you can see in specific areas. So you can see how under these different conditions, when you f flash a stimulus or when you do masking, you can now begin to inspect the entire brain. This is a single trial. Unlike fMRI, this is not averaged over multiple trials. Now, of course, we also like to go to the cellular uh, uh, level. So in that case, we've set up, to do that, we've set up over the last four years what we call the Allen Brain Observatory, which is a large pipeline of highly standardized procedures starting with neurosurgery and then training the animals. The animals um, uh, you know, are habituated. We do intrinsic signal imaging in order to locate the various uh, V1 in the various higher order visual areas. We do this in different cream mice. Then we can do imaging and we do it in such a way that we can go back uh, over multiple imaging sessions and we can return to individual neurons and image them. And finally, we do histology uh, to, to ascertain where exactly the neurons were. So this is a high throughput pipeline, involves many, many people from engineering, from animal husbandry, from across the entire institute, more than 100 people. And uh, as I mentioned, we do, um, we do this uh, intrinsic imaging in each case. So here, it's done in eight different animals, the CAX2 to uh, layer 2, 3 line, in these other Cree, Cree animals, uh, to, in order to locate are we in V1 or in which of the higher order visual areas we are. And here you can see this, we release this uh, um, uh, last month. You can download all of this data from our website. You don't need a login or anything else. So here you see a mouse running. And uh, while, it's being s while it's watching a movie, this is a classical Orson Welles movie, The Touch of Evil. Here you can see uh, um, Gcam activity, uh, um, Gcam 6. And we, mon we have lots of data. We monitor the, um, the eye. We monitor lots of other metadata. And all of that is available at our, at our website here, brain-map.org. Org. So um, in principle, given that we have the cellular, we have both the cellular data as well as we have the wide field imaging data, in principle we can, we can estimate measures like, like phi that have direct relevance to, to consciousness. Now lastly, uh, IT predicts that, uh, that particular structures that have a high fan in and a high fan out will, um, um, will have a high uh, phi associated with them because 
those sort of structures we know from, from and from simulation will maximize the degree of integration and differentiation a system has. Finally, this brings me to quite a mysterious structure in the mammalian brain, the claustrum. Shown here is the last paper that Francis Crick and I wrote a few days before his death on the function of the claustrum. We hypothesize that the claustrum, because of its widespread bidirectional connectivity to and from almost all cortical region, plays a key role in consciousness, integrating information across the entire cortical sheet. The metaphor we use is that the claustrum, acting as a conductor of the cortical symphony, coordinates the distinct cortical players to produce an integrated, consciously experienced percept, memory, or thought. So this shows you the, uh, the claustrum in a macaque monkey. Here it is in a human. It's roughly this big. It's roughly located here underneath the um, cortex, underneath the insula, and above the, um, and above the stratum. In humans, we know using diffusion tensor imaging, it's by far the most densely connected structure in the brain. And it has extensive uh, projection, ipsilateral as well as contralateral, between the claustrum, the claustrum and cortex going both ways. Um, and an um, interesting couple of years ago, uh, people, um, this was a patient that was slated for elective um, uh, surgery because she had epileptic seizures. Um, and every time the, the surgeon stimulated one electrode, the patient, every time the patient was stimulated in this electro electrode, the patient stared, stared, uh, had stopped what she was doing, and um, stared for as long as the electrical current lasted. She had no uh, recollection of the intervening episode, and because they had additional electrode in, they could see they, were, they monitored the brain. There wasn't any secondary discharges or absence uh, seizures. Very fascinating. And this particular electrode was in the extreme capsule just below the, the claustrum. The, um, the mouse has a claustrum like any other mammal. So this is um, here uh, shown or has drawn it in roughly where the location is. It's almost three millimeters, slightly curved. Here we can reconstruct it in a paper by Quan Xin Wang at the Institute. Uh, this is a quarter of a millimeter. It extends almost three millimeters anterior uh, and posterior. It's a very thin structure. And um, uh, we also know uh, specific genes, in this case guanine uh, nucleotide binding protein beta-4 is located. Uh, uh, it's located primarily, not quite exclusively, but primarily in the claustrum. Here you can see it. And so we can construct um, transgenic animals based on G, um, uh, G and B4 iris uh, cream mouse. And here you can see it's really very nicely located here uh, to the uh, claustrum. Here, if, we, if it's injected here, Quan Xin inject, made injection here, you can see how, how the axons project all the way to the back of the brain to the visual cortex and all the way to the front of the brain. And in fact, it's by far the, again, just like in humans, it is heavily, heavily connected. So this shows the, the ipsilateral connection, there are also contralateral connection um, to the claustrum, I mean, from, co uh, from cortex to claustrum and from claustrum to cortex. So you can see it's very, very heavily interconnected. So the question is what happens if you manipulate um, if you manipulate neurons in this using various optogenetic techniques, you turn them on and you turn them off. So this is the ongoing challenge. Develop sort of specific transgenic animals, measure GCAM6 activity in, in claustrum, both intrinsically as well as in the axons that project into, into cortex, manipulate these neurons and, and then uh, in, within a particular behavioral paradigm and see what the effect is. Now, all of that is the work of uh, several hundred people that are shown here. This is a team at the Allen Institute. And with that, I thank you for your attention.